Welcome, everybody. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Michael Reese. I work for Southeast Veterinary Neurology in the Boynton Beach office. So just to give you a quick rundown on myself. So I did my veterinary education at University of Florida. I did a year of an internship up at Tufts uh, near Boston and then a neurology internship uh, down at Gulf Coast in Houston, Texas, and then a three year residency at Purdue. I stayed on as um, assistant faculty for a year before moving to Florida. I definitely missed the warmer weather. And I mean, the last winter I was there, the popular thing to do was go out in the negative 40 degree wind, throw water up in the air and watch it freeze before it hit the ground. And that was when I knew I needed to move farther south to get away from that. So I have settled in at Southeast Veterinary Neurology. Um, I pick small animals for abrovascular accidents and, or strokes um, just because I think it's a, a fairly uh, common thing that we see. Um, I think now that we have MRIs available, uh, it's just a much more commonly diagnosed disease than what was previously thought. So today, as long as this works, um, the plan is to kind of go through um, one anatomy of the brain, talk about the types of strokes and how they're classified, talks about um, how dogs will present, and a lot of that just depends on where the stroke happens, um, diagnostic testing, and then prognosis and treatment. So treatment is pretty basic, definitely not as much to talk about there as some of the other diseases that we deal with in neurology. So I can't tell you how many times I've heard from people, well, I was taught that strokes don't happen. So I'm here to tell you they do happen in dogs and cats. Um, and there's lots and lots of articles now that describe this. So I picked this article um, that actually looked at the pathology of the brain, comparing it to human strokes. And the changes are the exact same. So when it comes down to it, a lot of what they see in people is closely mimicked of what we see in dogs, both in terms of the pathologic changes, but also on what we see in terms of diagnostic testing. So the same tests that they use in people are the same tests that we will use in dogs to look at the brain, to look for areas of ischemia. And we'll walk through that as we go through the MRI findings. So when we talk about the arterial supply of the brain, there's two big arteries that feed into the brain. One is the basal artery and the other one is the internal carotid. So if we track the arterial supply, starting with basal, the first branch off as you're going rostrally is the caudal cerebellar arteries. And as you migrate forward, then you get the rostral cerebellar, which is one of the most common arteries to occlude with a stroke. Then you get caudal cerebral, and then the very large middle cerebral artery, which um, supplies most of the cerebral hemispheres. And then there is an incomplete circle of Willis in a dog. And up at the very rostral aspect of the arterial circle, it basically feeds into the rostral cerebral arteries, which is going forward. So difference between dogs and cats with arterial supply is cats have a, a second um, artery supply that's actually more important, which is your maxillary artery. So that is feeding more of the brain and diving into internal carotid than dogs. And this is where they've had reports of mouth gags creating blindness in cats. It's because you're creating an arteriospasm with that maxillary artery, which is feeding the brain and blindness then is the secondary outcome of that. So, be very careful with mouth gags and kitties just because of that arterial difference. So I really like this image um, out of a, a book, the diagnostic MRI in, in dogs and cats, because it kind of gives you that color coding of what arteries are supplying what part of the brain. So generally speaking, the middle cerebral artery, I mean, that is supplying the vast majority of the brain in terms of the cerebral hemispheres. The very front midline is the rostral cerebral. The very caudal and midline is the caudal cerebral, but the vast majority of the brain is, is uh, supplied by the middle cerebral artery. As you get to the deep structures, you have stride arteries, which are feeding more of the basal ganglia area. You have um, the perforating arteries that are supplying kind of midbrain. Um, so, and then as you get to the cerebellum, you have rostral and caudal cerebellar arteries that are supplying the, the front and back half of the cerebellum as well as brainstem. And then the very back part of the brainstem and spinal cord is supplied by a vertebral 
So when we talk about strokes, location makes a big difference. So a rostral cerebral artery stroke just doesn't control nearly as much as a middle cerebral artery. So those can be pretty clinically insignificant in terms of creating deficits. So I've definitely seen dogs with three, four strokes at a time where the very kind of frontal lobe areas are silent and we're old. It wasn't until it got to something more significant where we saw the clinical signs come out um, to give us that then diagnosis of, hey, this dog's having strokes. So when we talk about the types of strokes, um, the, the two big categories are ischemic versus hemorrhagic, and then there, there can be a, a mixed one. Um, so ischemic stroke is exactly what your thought process is. You get a thrombus into the vasculature and it plugs up the arterial supply. So it creates a central area of injury that's permanent. That area of brain will die. It will then secondarily fill in with fluid because once the brain tissue is lost, the fluid just naturally fills that void. But there's an area around the stroke that is compromised but will recover um, as long as you give them some good TLC um, and then try to reduce the, the risk. So there's enough collateral supply to the area around it, which is the penumbra, um, for that area of brain to recover. So those are kind of the, the makeup of ischemic strokes. Hemorrhagic, something happens to the vascular wall where the wall basically breaks down and you get a hematoma of the brain. So more often than not, when I, I see these, they're older large breed dogs. Um, I've had a run of old English sheep dogs with these. Um, so it's something that you, you're wondering, hey, is there some sort of metabolic derangement that's causing the arteries to harden and to become friable, like atherosclerosis, um, what they talk about in people where you get that thickened plaque. Um, so is there something that's creating the vascular wall to become fragile in terms of bursting? So the arterial supply of the brain, I mean, it's meant to take big fluctuations in blood pressure depending on what we're doing. So the, the vessels have a degree of plasticity to expand to help kind of uh, maintain a, a steady intracranial pressure, blood pressure to the brain. Um, so if something's compromising that, then those vessels can burst. So there is a weird um, combination. So it's an ischemic stroke, a secondary hemorrhagic stroke. So it's basically a domino effect. So the ischemic stroke creates an injury that vascular wall is then compromised. So as reperfusion takes place, the artery then breaks open and then you get that hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, so it's hard to know for sure when you see a hemorrhagic stroke if an ischemic injury happened first. Uh, that's something we'll probably never be able to truly tease out. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that you'll see the hemorrhagic stroke and you'll not know if the ischemic one happened first um, based on MRI changes. So the other way we can talk about classifying strokes is based on size of the vessel. So when we talk about small size vessels, which are lacunar infarcts, it's basically one of the small perforating vessels or the end of the larger vessel where it's only supplying a small area of the brain. So this is a small focal area. Usually the clinical signs associated with these aren't too bad. Um, I mean, if you get into the balance system, then a teeny stroke can create a, a huge amount of issues, but when we're talking about like the cerebral hemisphere, a small lacunar infarct generally doesn't create a lot of problems. When you get into territorial infarcts, this is where you get a, a very large area of brain that becomes affected. So dogs with complete middle cerebral artery strokes, they will lose almost half of their cerebral hemisphere in a matter of seconds. Those dogs definitely are much more clinically significant in terms of their symptoms, as well as having much um, more guarded to poor prognosis in terms of recovery. You just can't lose that much area of your brain in, in one go and, and still be at least a, a pet that has a good quality of life to follow. So when we talk about um, another type of stroke um, and people, they call them transient ischemic attacks. And I definitely have seen a few dogs like this. They're really short-lived strokes, but they rapidly resolve. So a blood clot gets in, it doesn't complete a complete obstruction, that clot then breaks down and they go back to normal. I mean, I've seen a, a little schnauzer that was running around perfectly normal within seconds, was so vestibular, was rolling across the ground, and then five minutes later, he was up running around like nothing ever happened. So dogs with 
TIAs, generally there's some sort of underlying metabolic problem that you need to address, whether they're cushionoid, whether they're hypothyroid, whether they have renal disease and proteinuria, something's making them coagulopathic to where you need to start blood thinners and to address something metabolic. So these are real hard to diagnose on MRI unless you're actually imaging them at the time of the event, which is pretty much impossible for our veterinary patients since you have to anesthetize them to actually get the images. So it's not something we will ever be able to, to trace in dogs, but they've definitely documented in people and really within moments it's gone. So there's no permanent injury left behind. So when we talk about these dogs and cats when they present, generally they're older. So I mean, a lot of times what we're looking at is some sort of metabolic disease and that's something that comes with age. So the one big difference to that is the feline ischemic encephalopathy. So that's the migrating cuter rebra. Um, so when that happens, the cuter rebra creates vasospasms as it's migrating through the brain and that is usually what creates middle cerebral artery um, vascular compromise. So those kitties will lose a fair amount of their brain real quick if you let that cuter rebra keep migrating. We definitely don't see this hardly ever. Um, I've been in Boynton for three years and I've seen two and it was from the same family which was a bit odd um, but the first kitty um, we ended up finding it on histopath afterwards because we didn't know what was going on and they didn't want to image. The second kitty happened a few months after that. We imaged and you could actually see the track going through the brain uh, as it was migrating through. So that one's doing fantastic with some ivermectin. So they're definitely super bizarre cases. Don't see them very often, but um, at least for a kitty, if you're starting to see neurologic deficits, feline ischemic encephalopathy seems to at least have some very rare occurrences down here. Um, a lot of times for older dogs, though, we're looking for a metabolic disorder. The difference being breed-specific um, predispositions. So greyhounds, by far, are the most well-described dogs with strokes. I mean, anytime I see a greyhound, it's pretty much a stroke until proven otherwise. Um, the other big one is cancer. So, I mean, for the most part, greyhounds, uh, I, I have yet to see one with a disc. I'm sure it happens. It's just... I've yet to see one, but I've seen probably a hundred with a stroke. So um, that would be the, the most likely uh, miniature schnauzer since they tend to run um, hyperlipidotic. Um, that increased flat, uh, fat in the blood seems to, to predispose them to, to having strokes. Um, so those are the two big um, breeds I associated with any sort of acute onset of neurologic disease. It's, it's stroke more often than not. So it should be some sort of peritude to acute onset of symptoms, and those symptoms are all going to be based on what part of the nervous system is affected. So if you affect the prosencephalon or the, the cerebral hemispheres, you get some sort of behavior change, circling, seizures. One of my worst epileptic patients was a dog with a complete cerebral metabolic or a stroke. I mean, I had him loaded on phenobarbital, keperobromide, and zanisamide within 24 hours, and he was still seizing his brains out. Um, so it took a high dose of midazolam, CRI, and all those drugs to finally get them to stop. Um, he never really recovered right. He pretty much was a space cadet forever after that. Um, but uh, in the grand scheme of things, seizures are probably one of the more common things, though, and they don't have to create seizures at the time of the stroke. It can be months later, some kind of like uh, motor vehicle accidents and people, you don't always see, you know, the signs of seizures right at that time. The injury to the brain can create some scar tissue or gliosis and, and long term that then becomes a seizure focus. So even if they um, had a, a stroke, I mean, it can be months later that they actually start to have seizures. Um, brainstem cerebellum. So this is definitely one of the most common places we see strokes in dogs. Um, so usually they're vestibular and there should be fairly lateralizing signs just um, in order to take out the whole brainstem to get symmetrical signs. 
um, they probably wouldn't be breathing anymore. So usually it's a lateralized line, and that's the rostral cerebellar artery. So um, you can see hypermetria, you can see the head tilt, the uh, paradoxical vestibular, you can see hemiparesis, so weakness on the, the side of the stroke circling. Usually they'll circle towards the side of the stroke just because it's creating the paresis, so they push themselves in the circle in that direction. Uh, head tremors, so strokes um, of the cerebellum can create the head tremors. Um, uh, and then mentation changes is it's affecting the brainstem. So that's different behavior changes or they're acting a little bit unusual. Maybe you'll see a change in their appetite. Mentation changes I'm talking are the untended stuporous comatose type of changes. So if you affect big parts of the brainstem, that reticular activating system is what's responsible for waking up your brain. If you start compromising that, then you start compromising your level of consciousness. And then spinal cord strokes, um, you get a degree of either paresis or plegia, depending on how bad it is. So um, spinal cord strokes, I mean, when you talk about dogs, young Labradors chasing a ball, FCE is by far the most common thing that we would see for a lateralizing paresis. Um, but that being said, cats have a special thing. They're always special um, where they can have um, strokes of their, their cervical spinal cord. So we'll go through that here in just a, a short bit. Generally speaking, strokes are non-painful. So this should be a condition where maybe they seem painful initially, but within hours it should be something that they don't see painful. So either palpation of their spine or movement around or palpation of their head, um, they should be non-painful. So the only place in the central nervous system that can be associated with pain sensation is the thalamus. So there is a thalamic pain syndrome. So the lamic strokes technically can, um, but that's definitely few and far between. I have hardly seen any dogs painful from a stroke. So when we talk about then working these dogs up, again, we're looking for something systemic to, to increase their risk for stroke. So blood pressure, looking for evidence of hypertension, CBC chem, really I'm looking at uh, liver kidney values. Kidney values don't always go up um, when they're um, starting to develop their chronic kidney disease. So the, the urinalysis is super important in these dogs looking for proteinuria. And a UPC is definitely very important to try to quantify it so then you can track it over time. So proteinuria, one of the smallest proteins in your blood is antithrombin-3. So that is one that helps you not spontaneously clot in your blood. So um, it's really important to look for evidence of proteinuria in these dogs. Thyroid levels, so cats with hyperthyroidism, generally they're hypertensive too. So um, they kind of have two factors there that work against them. And then hypothyroid for dogs, I mean, that's where you talk about potentially atherosclerosis forming and, and making them a little bit more prone to, to clot. So it's important to start with a, a general metabolic screen for an older dog. If you have any inkling of elevated ALP, proteinuria, any of that, Cushing's testing is important. I've been burned by this so many times in big dogs. They just don't show the symptoms of PUPD, polyphagia. Sometimes it's just a little bit of excessive panting and they have a mildly elevated ALP. Um, and then that is enough to, to drive the proteinuria. So prednisone, um, generally creates a, a low amount of proteinuria, so it does increase the risk of stroke. So even in my chronic uh, meningitis dogs that I have on protein long-term, sometimes I put them on blood thinners just because of weird events that happen, which I attribute to probably having strokes. So um, don't discount Cushing's even if they don't show the typical signs. And then thoracic radiographs, really, this is important for looking for evidence of metastatic disease. Generally, it's not a metabolic thing, but um, especially things like lymphoma, uh, there are cases of intravascular lymphoma, lymphoma that then um, create vascular accidents of the brain. So certainly possible. And then things like hemangiosarc, since they have access to the blood vessels. Um, the one that had the middle cerebral artery stroke I mentioned earlier, and I'll show you images of the brain here shortly. Um, that dog ended up developing um, metastatic disease in his lungs a, a month after he recovered. So only lived a short bit of time after that. So when we talk about the diagnostic test of choice, MRI is by far the test that gives you the most amount of information. 
and people, they'll put you into a CT first. I mean, I think people also have more of a tendency to have either aneurysms or bleeds um, as opposed to dogs, which are more often ischemic than hemorrhagic. So a hemorrhagic stroke, I would, I would bet we can find on a CT no problem, but since that's the minority of cases, really MRI, you'll see both. So it's the better choice test. Um, some of it also depends on, you know, uh, the patient. So if they're in renal failure or have some other huge comorbidity to anesthesia, then the CT is definitely a much faster test. So you can do a CT of the brain in about 10 minutes versus an hour long MRI. But bang for your buck, the MRI is going to give you way more information. So when we talk about MRI changes, what we look at is um, hyperintensity on T2. So T2 is a scan that there's two things that are showing up right. One is fat, which there's fat pretty much all around your body, but the other one is fluid. So any disease of the central nervous system generally creates some degree of increased fluid to go along with it. So that's inflammation or swelling, whether it's ischemic injury where the, the cell bodies are swelling or there's um, vascular compromise um, where you get basogenic edema related to kind of inflammation and that's that's then giving you the the increased fluid signal so most lesions in the brain um, from disease are going to be t2 hyperintense so that's your screening test to look for areas of injury and generally speaking strokes happen in the gray matter way more than they happen in the white matter so usually you're looking on the periphery of the brain to to look for those injuries so the test that really gives you that hey, is this ischemic or not, is called a diffusion-weighted image. And it's a T2 scan, but what they've done is some brilliant person created the algorithm that you use that to then create this ADC map or an apparent diffusion coefficient. And what you'll see is the, the stroke will um, look right on a T2 because it is already T2 hyperintense. It'll look right on the um, BWI, but the algorithm, if it's ischemic, will then make it look dark. And what it's looking at is the normal vibration or Brownian motion of water. So if you have an ischemic event, the water is basically trapped in place, but so it loses that free vibration tendency. And that's what they're looking at is that reduced Brownian motion to say, hey, this area is ischemic. So I don't know how they ever came up with this, but um, it's the same thing they do in people as well as, as dogs. And you can pick up this change within an hour on an MRI for a vascular accident. So it happens real soon. So um, generally we're getting them much later than that. So the, the DWIs can look pretty darn um, profound once we get to them. And then if we're looking for areas of hemorrhage, the gradient echo or GRE is what we typically use. So this is looking for blood breakdown products. So once you bleed, your blood starts to break down. So it goes from oxyhemoglobin to deoxyhemoglobin to intracellular hemoglobin. The red blood cell breaks down, so that methemoglobin then goes extracellular, and then the hemoglobin's broken down to hemosiderin. So um, through that process, um, the GRE can pick up most of them. So the oxyhemoglobin, the extracellular methemoglobin, there's a little bit of touch and go on when the GRE works and when it doesn't. But the GRE has this super dark black appearance, um, which the rest of the blood has none, uh, or the rest of the brain has none. So if you see these black spots in the brain, then you know there's a degree of hemorrhage that's happened. So that's what you're looking for with the gradient echo. And I do have examples of all of these to kind of walk you through. So this is a rostrocerebellar artery um, ischemic event, and it's a lacunar one. So it's a small area of the cerebellum that was affected. You can see in the left cerebral hemisphere on the dorsal image, which is on the left, it's almost wedge-shaped at the end of that arrow. If you look at the transverse image where you're looking front to back, you can see it's not quite as wedge shaped, but it's pretty darn close in that left kind of dorsal cerebral hemisphere. And if you look at the, the DWI up top, it's bright. And then the ADC map, you can see it's really dark. So if it was not a stroke, um, the ADC map would still show up as bright. Um, so what they call it is T2 shine through. So gliomas are a common tumor that we see that will look bright on T2, they'll look bright on the diffusion, but they don't have areas of um, reduced Brownian motion, so they'll still be bright white on an ADC map versus what we're seeing here, um, where it's turned dark, which fits with a stroke. And that's, that's exactly what mimics what they see in people. <laughs>
So if we then talk about greyhounds, this is a greyhound I saw for acutely um, having a tendency to turn left and knuckling in the right front leg. So there's a T2 hyperintensity in the rostral um, temporal parietal area. You can see it very clearly on the diffusion and it's dark on the ADC map. So, and I don't see this image up here as well, but you can see it's, it's, it's hyper intense in the, uh, the, the left temporal parietal lobe. And this dog did amazingly well. Within a few weeks, he was walking normally again. So that is the typical greyhound um, that I would see um, if we talk about the dog that lost half of his brain, that would be this one. So you can see the hyperintensity that's pretty much the entire left side of the cerebral hemisphere. I move this out of the way. Um, you can see, I mean, it's almost the entire side of his brain that, that was affected. It's hyper intense on diffusion. It's dark on the ADC map. So um, this dog, yeah, when you lose that much brain, it just, the recovery is definitely not nearly as good as the greyhound that we just looked at. So um, the amount of brain that is affected definitely affects prognosis. So compare that to a hemorrhagic um, stroke. This is a, an old English sheep dog. So I have a flare image and flare what is, is a fluid attenuated inversion recovery. So you're taking the normal fluid signal and making it dark. So that bright spinal fluid that is in the ventricles normally is now black. So anything that's got a proteinaceous or complex type of fluid still shows up bright white. So that's what all this brightness is around this very well-defined round structure in the middle of the brain. And if we looked at that GRE that I was talking about where it shows up black, you can see there's a very clearly well-defined round GRE void mass because it's creating compression of this ventricle. If you compare this one's appearance to this one, you can appreciate the ventricles getting pushed up and in. So it's creating a mass effect in the, the right um, temporal lobe. You can also see little dark spots um, in the left side, and those are little microbleeds. So they're not nearly as significant, but that also tells you this dog is having a predisposition to having these microbleeds, and a microbleed probably ended up into a more significant bleed. So if you're looking at pre and post contrast, you can see it's very hard to see on T1, but when you give them contrast, you can see that very well-defined contrast enhancing rim that's er, encircling the, the lesion. So that tells me that the inflammation is all on the outside of the mass. The inside is a blood clot, so it doesn't have any vascular supply, which is what the contrast is feeding into. So as opposed to like gliomas, generally there's some degree of vascularity that gets into it. They don't always contrast enhance, but some of them when they contrast enhance, they can be rim enhancing, but they can also have little patchy areas within. So that is a, a typical hemorrhagic stroke, and I, I've had three English sheepdogs now within the last couple of years with these. And then cerebral microbleeds are definitely a different type of entity. Um, we see these in older dogs. Um, the, the question is, how often are they clinically significant? Sometimes I feel like they're incidental, but they are linked to Alzheimer's in people or dementia, just as an age-related change. Um, they also um, uh, related to amyloid plaque deposition. So um, these, generally, they're more kind of well-defined. The amyloid plaques, they, they have more of a kind of blooming. So it almost looks like a, a super dark center with this kind of blooming effect around it where it gets to a, a darker gray to lighter gray um, area of a halo. So this is an older dog uh, presented for just kind of behavior changes. Um, so usually they're not super distinct in terms of what deficits they're causing, but they're just kind of older dogs that are just not acting themselves. They'll be a little bit spacey. So I mean, this dog probably had 20 or 30 of these throughout its entire brain. So it looks like buckshot when, when you start scrolling through it. So microbleeds are definitely a, a little bit of a different entity. I've started treating them more with uh, blood thinners, wondering if some of these are related to small strokes that become then hemorrhagic. Um, and I have seen at least an improvement in, in some of the patients with that. So um, I do think there's still a lot we need to figure out about these microbleeds, uh, but 
we have some at least literature that they're not truly um, remarkable in terms of mind-blowing lesions, but um, they are kind of linked to, to a worse prognosis overall and one of the more recent kind of literature reviews of what they do. And then the kitties. So this is definitely a very cat-specific disease. They, they call it feline ischemic myelopathy. It's definitely an older cat disease and almost always there's some sort of underlying metabolic problem. So uh, whether they're chronic kidney disease, whether they're hyperthyroid, uh, so something that would make them predisposed to stroke. And so this is a kitty I got last year. Initially saw for acute um, non-ambulatory tetraparesis, had renal disease on its blood work. So we initially discussed, hey, let's just give the kitty a chance. Um, we'll hold off on anesthesia for now, just because we've got renal disease and anesthesia is not maybe the, the most ideal approach. Um, we'll see if the kitty gets back up. And within a week, the kitty was up and walking and then the next week was down again. So I was like, okay, let's at least go looking, make sure we know what we're doing. And lo and behold, when we looked at her spine on an MRI, this is a sagittal view. So her brain's over here, neck's coming down, tail's way off to the right. You have a hyper intense lesion sitting right over C23. You have a hyper intense lesion seen over the cranial C2 and that's, this image and transverse and this image and transverse to give you those areas of fairly well-defined um, hyperintensity at the bottom compared to what spinal cord should look like. So those are two areas of vascular compromise. So strokes, um, so that explains one why she initially was doing better. So if you were gonna ask me which one happened first, I'd say this one that you can see it's very uh, bright in the middle, so I would bet this one's a little bit more aged where you've lost a little bit of brain, or not brain, uh, spinal cord where it's starting to fill in with fluid. This one's maybe not quite as clearly organized yet. Uh, so I would say this was probably the second one um, in terms of a, a domino effect from the, the disease. So we ended up starting her on Plavix and she did great for almost a year and then she had another episode. So fortunately with feline ischemic myelopathy when you have underlying kidney disease or something that's driving a forward, um, the, the recurrence rate is definitely there. So when we talk about prognosis, a lot of this just depends on what artery is affected, how much of the artery affected, and, and where that artery is going. So um, if you affects the entire middle cerebral artery. I mean, losing an entire cerebral hemisphere all of a sudden, the prognosis is poor. I mean, they just don't recover back to good quality of life, in my opinion. It's not that they can't, but I, I have yet to see one. Um, but my N of three isn't probably a, a great, um, I guess, number to completely give up on the, the patients without giving them a chance. But um, a lot of that just depends on how much is truly permanent injury versus the penumbra. But uh, I would say it's going to be a rare instance where a dog will recover from a complete metal cerebral artery occlusion without significant neurologic debilitation. The location, so there's lots of silent areas in the brain and the brain of dogs and cats is just not set up like us. So they can lose big areas and not um, show a lot of symptoms associated with it, which is why some hydrocephalic dogs can live perfectly healthy lives, even though they have just a thin rim of brain. So um, silent areas of the brain, I mean, sometimes we don't even know they happen. So um, it's, we're looking for something completely separate or, you know, it's one of those dogs that um, they're 10 years old, they start having seizures, we go looking and we find an old stroke. So um, it's just a, uh, 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 location dependent disease. So if you affect the thalamus, I mean, that's the relay center for the brain. So you can see vestibular problems, you can see seizures, you can see uh, movement problems just because that's coordinating uh, proprioception. So um, it definitely is, is one of those things that I would much rather have a stroke up in like the caudate nucleus, which for the most part, you can see some some degree of kind of movement disorder or tremors, but not a lot of overall deficits associated with it. And then severity. So yeah, it also comes down to what their symptoms are. So vestibular disease, I mean, so many people look at vestibular dogs and they want to write them off because they look terrible, but 
mean, if you give them a chance, a lot of them will get better. Uh, so uh, vestibular symptoms, I mean, when they are acute, they're rolling around on the ground, they're hard to evaluate. If you've ever had one of those dogs where you actually are like, okay, I can't test your proprioception because you're too busy trying to flop yourself over. Um, there is a trick that you can do to try to stabilize them. So if you put your hand side to side across their temples and squeeze gently, it does help them stabilize a little bit. So um, even if they're lying on the ground and trying to roll, if you put something across their head and to have that pressure going side to side across their zygomatic arch, um, it does help them kind of ground themselves at least a little bit. So um, that can at least give you a chance to check proprioception. So anytime we get vestibular dogs, I mean, the big question is it central or peripheral? So you need proprioception to help guide that decision. So if it's acute onset and peripheral, old dog vestibular disease is certainly a good rule out. You can't say it's still not central, but um, if they don't have any deficits, then uh, certainly you can give them time and see what happens. And I do wonder if some of the old dog vestibular disease and the common kind of diagnosis of that were mild strokes that just didn't have any deficits that you could appreciate. So. Um, it's definitely a big question mark in my mind of how often is it truly old dog vestibular? Or is it just a stroke? Um, based on, on what we're seeing these days and that we're able to actually diagnose them with, with the availability of MRI as it is now. So give them a chance. It usually takes a couple, three days, but what you'll see is the nystagmus looks real bad initially, and then you'll see it start to slow down and eventually it'll stop. Um, and then once you see it stop, then what I do is generally either roll them on their back or take, tip their head up and you'll still see it kind of still subtly there and I'll take a couple more days before that goes away. And then usually about that time, they're able to start getting up and walk around again. So um, vestibular disease, I mean, just give them a chance. I can't stress that enough. I mean, it's just amazing how well the balance system can adapt to injury. If you're talking about um, weakness, um, paralysis is definitely a more significant um, sign compared to paresis. So if they can still move their legs, generally um, they'll get back up on their feet. Paralysis is a little bit more touch and go. I mean, if you have a tetraplegic animal, I mean, I, they still have to be able to feel their toes just because if you can't, um, you can't breathe anymore. Like the brainstem has to talk to your phrenic nerve to drive breathing. So you can't be tetraplegic, deep pain negative and still be alive. Um, so it just can't physically work. Um, so uh, paralysis though, I mean, clearly you're affecting more of the spinal cord to get that degree of, of severity to the, the, the symptoms. Um, so those aren't as, as clear cut in terms of who gets better, but I mean, a lot of times they'll get better. They might need some physical therapy to kind of boost them along. Um, but in the end, they should be able to hopefully stand and walk on their own. If they have a little bit of weakness, then in the end, they're still at least able to walk and function and, and be happy kiddos because, again, it's not a painful process. It's just creating weakness. So, and then a lot of it also then depends on the patient. So if they have significant comorbidities, they're going to be more likely to have either recurrent disease or or other kind of hurdles along the way that you need to, to get over. So um, if you have a dog with a brain tumor and a stroke, I mean, the worst, I guess, case scenario for me is you put them on a blood thinner and then the tumor bleeds. So um, it it's definitely makes it more complicated when you start putting compounding factors into the mix, especially pituitary tumors. So there is a condition called apoplexy where the tumor is a vascular organ it bleeds into itself and it rapidly expands so i think we've seen probably four or five in the last year where they're just running around perfectly normal and then laterally recumbent and it's because a, a fairly moderate sized pituitary tumor became a big one all of a sudden and that rapid expansion just decompensates their their cerebral perfusion and they they go downhill real quick with that so um, that's at least judging prognosis, um, looking to back it up with literature. Um, so there was a retrospective done looking at 22 dogs with strokes. I mean, there is a proportion that die very quickly and some of it might be that they just, the owners saw, you know, the, the severity of the signs and threw in the towel, they didn't really say, but for the dogs, dogs that lived past a month, 
they lived an average of a year and a half. So, I mean, that's a pretty decent survival um, time considering, um, but there is a fair amount of them that have a repeat event sometime later. And that's where most of the times when I'm getting dogs with strokes, uh, if we can't find an underlying cause that would predispose them to stroke, then I put them on Plavix. And I mean, Plavix or Clopidogrel, it's such a safe drug. Um, if, if I have any questions at all or worry that they're going to be a repeat offender, I just put them on it anyway. So pretty much any greyhound that I'm worried about having a stroke, um, they've heard Plavix right off the bat. So they have looked at like risk factors associated with heart disease. So at Purdue, um, we did do um, a, a kind of brief study just having uh, team cardiology, ultrasound of the heart, and I mean, structurally, we didn't really find any heart disease in any of the dogs that we found strokes in, but looking at cardiac troponin levels in a small number of dogs, um, they did find that the, the levels were uh, elevated in acute stroke, but didn't really offer anything prognostically or, or to say, hey, this potentially will increase risk long term. Thromboelastography or TEG and D-dimers. So another real small study looking at that. Uh, the D-dimers were normal in all the dogs. Two out of the five were hypercoagulable on TEG and the other ones were suspected. Um, TEG is definitely one of those very user dependent tests. So, I mean, I've definitely seen it run and the people that run it all the time, either love it or hate it, or maybe a little bit of both. Um, it's, it's definitely a finicky test. Um, so it's not super widely available because of that. Um, but it does give you at least an information on, hey, are they more prone to clotting um, or not? But you'd need to find a location that can actually do it. I bet University of Florida offers it just based on my internship at Tufts. They, they did a lot of tags and um, some of the ECC folks from up there are now at University of Florida, so um, I bet they have access to it at this point just based on their, their kind of leaning towards that test while they were during, doing their residency up there. Um, looking at the microbleeds, so we talked about this initially, so it is linked to shortened survivals in this paper looking at 582 dogs. I mean, based on straight power. I mean, this is a better sample size to give you at least a, a more representative um, evaluation of, of what's real and what's not. So out of the 582 dogs with strokes, microbleeds were 54 of them. So it was commonly linked with cortical atrophy, which is a normal age-related change to the brain. So unfortunately, as you get older and eyes get older and as dogs get older, our brains undergo atrophy. So they shrink, the, the fluid spaces outside the sulci, they get widened and deepened, the inside ventricles, they get bigger. So the cortical atrophy is pretty easy to pick up on MRI. So that was seen fairly often with the microbleeds and then they commonly found proteinuria. So that's one of the reasons why I've, I've kind of started treating more microbleeds with a blood thinner and just they they seem to have a more tendency towards um, stroke in my opinion based on that and how many they typically generally have so um, it's not an underlying contributing factor but it's there and that at least uh, worries me enough that i'd like to try to um, see if i can reduce any stroke tendencies just in case and again it's a super well tolerated drug so i once a day i, I don't see the harm in it unless there's something else that would make me concerned that we are going to increase the, the bleeding tendency for something else going on that's more important. So compared to the other dogs that had strokes, they across the board had a short survival time. So I mean, from the stroke standpoint, the microbleeds seem to be the more kind of pathologic ones um, and, and increasing the, the morbidity, mortality um, based on the typical ischemic ones or the hemorrhagic. So when we talk about treatment for strokes, it all comes down to supportive care. So when we're talking about supportive care, if they aren't eating and drinking, they need fluids. And again, a lot of these dogs have some sort of undermined metabolic disease. So even if they have renal disease, they're not gonna be drinking enough to maintain their renal health. So IV fluids is important for um, maintaining fluid status. Um, Anti-nausea, so, if you have a dog that's vestibular, generally nausea is gonna contribute to some of their reduced appetite, reduced 
desire to drink. So um, Serenia, the motion sickness dose is eight drinks per keg. I mean, that would be a small fortune uh, for most big dogs. So generally I give two makes per keg and that seems to do all right. I mean, you can use one make per keg, that's fine. Um, I generally just go a little bit higher to try to get a little bit more bang for my buck out of the motion sickness aspect of that drug. You can use meclidine, um, so that's a once a day drug. And I mean, generally it's 25 milligrams. Um, once to twice a day, depending on, on how bad the dog is. Uh, most of the time I'm using it once a day. So the big thing for vestibular disease is you don't want to keep them on it long-term. So you're, you're initially helping with symptoms, but the vestibular disease, the, the brain's trying to compensate for that. So the, the vestibular system will reset what it thinks its status quo is for normal. And that's where you start to see all the signs go away, the, the nystagmus and everything. So by treating with antihistamines and anti-motion sickness drugs, you're actually going to end up hindering that process long term. So once you get over the hump where they're eating and drinking comfy, you should withdraw those drugs. So you're helping the, the balance system recover a little bit more efficiently. If you have a dog with seizures, um, you need to reach for anticonvulsants, and a lot of it just depends on how bad the seizures are. Uh, Keppra is probably the nicest one to treat with just because it's the least sedating. Uh, if you have uh, a dog with really bad seizures, then phenobarbital is probably the better way to go. So it does have a cerebr cerebral protective quality to it, so it's reducing cerebral metabolic demand. So if you have an area of ischemia, it's not getting the demand it needs. So um, it, it can protect it from that standpoint. And I mean, most of the time these are older dogs, so I would load them on eight milligrams per kilogram in one injection. Some people like to give four milligrams per kilogram and two separate injections four hours later. I think either one is fine, but to me, if I'm gonna be loading a dog on phenobarbital, I'd like to just get it on board and we will sort the rest out after that. Um, it's rare that it creates so much profound sedation that there are bumps on a log, but I mean, if they've had a stroke and it's a bad enough one, then they might be there anyway. So um, it's not something that I, I have a huge consideration about in terms of giving it one, one injection. And my young dogs, um, I'll give 16 milligrams per kilogram as a loading dose and just Based on volume of distribution, that gives you about a drug level of 20. So it's not a super high level, but I get there in one injection, so I know what I get out of it all at once. And most of the time, you wouldn't notice, except for a little ataxia that they got it. So back to treatment of strokes, um, rotating side. So if they can't get up on their own, um, really, you need to flip them side to side to prevent the cubital ulcers, prevent atelectasis. So uh, generally speaking, vestibular dogs will want to lay on one side or the other. It's all a matter of where their stroke is. So they will bite you tooth and nail if you put them onto the other side. So in those dogs, um, you can either keep them sternal and rotate their hips or you can try putting like a sandbag across their head, like I was saying, to see if that can help them feel a little bit grounded. And then sometimes I do give them like Valium or Aramidazolam to help kind of sedate them so they're not just constantly trying to roll around. So, Hygiene, so they're clearly not always coherent of what they're doing, so they'll have accidents. If they can't get up, then they're gonna be sitting in urine, so you wanna prevent urine scold. So um, you gotta keep them clean and dry. It's really important to keep them dry. So um, the dogs that I'm worried about will be down for a little bit. We do kind of shave down their fur a little bit um, to try to make sure we're getting their skin dry. Gold, pound, gold bond powder will be one of your best friends just because it does soak up moisture to help kind of keep them dry. Uh, so those are at least my tricks for trying to, to keep them healthy as you're giving the, the nervous system time to recover. If they have an underlying metabol metabolic disorder, you have to address it. So if they have Cushing's, you need to manage that. If they're hypothyroid, you have to manage that. If they're proteinuric, generally benazapril is at least indicated. But then after that, the, the goal is to reach for something antithrombotic. So that's where I reach for clopidogrel. So three to five mix per keg is where I'm usually going once a day. You can use ultra low dose aspirin. So there was a, a study looking at this, or they used it in 24 dogs and, and they didn't find any problems using either each one individually or a combination of the two. So really they're safe drugs. 
should be like warfarin where you're checking bleeding times all the time. So I have yet to really have a problem with clopidogrel aside from, I think I've had one dog with GI upset on it. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a super safe drug um, so far for, for all the times I've used it. If those don't work, generally I tag in somebody smarter than me. Um, so when you start reaching for like low molecular weight heparins or warfarin, uh, I tag either internal medicine or more often I think cardiology likes to take these just because of all the bleeding times that they end up having to monitor. So um, that's something I'm definitely not as, as familiar with and would rather somebody who's more knowledgeable in that area kind of drive the boat from there. Um, so uh, for the most part though, I feel like clopidogrel and ultra low dose aspirin, I, I haven't had a lot of dogs that have failed that therapy. So um, that's usually where I go. I usually start with clopidogrel, and if I have any concerns that it's not enough, then I add in the low-dose aspirin. So that is what I've got. And I mean, to me, the important thing is strokes do happen in, in our veterinary patients. So um, it's been documented at least enough times that you should be not hard to find literature that says, yes, strokes happen. Uh, so just um, don't discount that in any older dog with an acute onset of any sort of neurologic deficits. So I'm not saying it's going to be all of it. Um, we've definitely had lots of brain tumors where they present acutely. So dogs are really good at hiding their problems. So just because it's acute doesn't make it a stroke, um, but it should be at least on the list. So the more acute signs associated with neurologic problems usually present with more severe symptoms. So any sort of acute kind of compromise to the neurologic system, they're just gonna generally look worse, but it doesn't matter how bad they look in terms of vestibular symptoms, a lot of times they will get better if you just give them time and supportive care. The, the real severe forebrain dogs, I mean, if they lose half their brain, those, those dogs just don't recover well. I probably said that at least enough times. Um, MRI really is the best test to go looking. Um, so it's just, you're not gonna miss an ischemic stroke versus CT that, that would. So um, it, bang for your buck, it's, it's worth the, the look using MRI versus something else. Um, any dog with a stroke on your list, um, you really need to screen for some sort of metabolic disease. So don't forget the urine. It's super important to check urine in these dogs. And then antithrombotics, really, any dog that's had a stroke, I mean, for the most part, unless it's a uh, dog that went to the groomer and got super stressed out and had one, usually there's an underlying predisposing factor to make them at a higher risk. So it's important to go, to go looking for it as well as treating to try to reduce that risk. So at this point, I think we can open up for questions unless I am mistaken. And I was, oh, I neglected to tell you, uh, you should get an email with the um, certificate for this, this course um, within an hour after we are finished. So I think, Ashley, I've, I've done what I told, but just a little late. So I have one question so far, and the question is, do you recommend using steroids? And the answer is no. So steroids are actually contraindicated in strokes. So it puts you towards uh, an anaerobic uh, metabolism already. Um, using steroids, and if you're already in an anaerobic environment because of ischemia, it can compound that injury. So strokes are actually contraindicated in, in um stroke injury. So from a standpoint of if you think it's a stroke, you should avoid steroids until um, you give them a chance. So the other problem you have with steroids is if you have a dog with a stroke and you start steroids, it will probably start to get better within three days and then you don't know if the steroids worked or not. So strokes will get better one way or the other. But the strokes, if you throw prednisone into the, into the mix, that penumbra might get bigger in terms of what's more permanently damaged. And why can I only, let's see if I can make this bigger here. Can vocalizing be one of the clinical signs associated with stroke? And absolutely, so anything that's changing mentation um, or, I'm sorry, behavior. Uh, so uh, they call it sundowners effects in, in people uh, where you get that kind of significant dementia signs um, where 
sometime in the evening, some dogs will just sit there screaming and cannot be consoled. So um, I've definitely seen that with stroke injuries. So um, in the grand scheme of things, yeah, anything that's changing their behavior from normal would be on my list for, for a clinical sign. So then I have another question about not painful after the event, but patient feels pain at the moment a stroke occurs. So generally speaking, there shouldn't be pain. So there is actually no nociception in the actual central nervous system except for the thalamus. So generally speaking, they shouldn't feel pain, but I'm sure they feel real funny as things are losing function. So I think some of the vocalization that you see at the time is they're like, what the heck just happened? I can't use the side of my body or something like that. So um, generally speaking, um, but FCEs, I mean, there is question. Um, it's been described enough that they can be painful for a short period of time afterwards. So is there something happening at that time? I mean, certainly it's, it's certainly hard to, to determine. Dr. Levine, you always come up with real good questions. So let me see what, looking at all your, the question is when looking at all your ischemic or hemorrhagic infarct patients overall, what percentage of patients do you ever find an underlying abnormality on UPC, RADS, ultrasound, buccal mucosal bleeding time, PT, PTT, CSF, tick titers, et cetera? So I guess his, his, his uh, comment was he maybe sees it about 30% of the time. Otherwise, 70% of the time he's got nothing. So um, I, I would say 30% to maybe 50% of the time, I'll find that we have at least some degree of proteinuria, if not um, low thyroid or Cushing. So um, the rest of the time, if I don't have an answer, Dr. Levine, I, I mean, I just put them on clopidogrel and, and assume that there's, there's something that I just don't know, um, unfortunately. Uh, there's only so many tests that we can truly run and without like a tag to say, hey, are you hypercoagulable? Uh, I think a lot of the extra tests, I, I don't typically run down for like BMBTs and PTTs. Um, for the most part, I, I would probably start at, at the uh, urinalysis UPC and ultrasound of the abdomen just to make sure we're not missing anything neoplastic. So the next question is, would you please discuss old dog vestibular disease versus stroke? So, I mean, old dog vestibular disease is, is based on history is supposed to be a strictly peripheral vestibular problem. So with an acute onset, it should be rapidly resolving. So um, there should not be any centralized deficits. So the question is, a lot of those old dog vestibular disease patients that have been previously kind of talked about. I don't know how many of them truly had MRIs to look at it. They just were given time and they got better. I mean, I know some of them are backed up with normal MRIs, but does that truly mean that there wasn't something like a stroke that happened? Um, so I think there is a big gray area in between old dog vestibular and stroke that I'm not sure we'll ever sort out, but um, stroke is truly a blood clot. You should be able to see it on the MRI more often than not. But I mean, some of the small patients, I mean, even a tiny stroke can create havoc in the balance system. So could it be that MRI is just not as sensitive for our, you know, six kig um, dogs that um, have brains the size of, you know, uh, a small Clementine. So Maybe MRI is just not good. And when we get to like three Tesla magnets where you get more kind of potency and cleaner images, maybe we'll see a little bit more. Um, but I think for 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 now, the, the big thing for old dog vestibular versus stroke would be the, the centralizing deficit. So if you see deficits in proprioception or you see paradoxical vestibular where their head tilts going to the same direction as their nice diagnosis, then um, it's, it's got to be something central, which puts old dog vestibular off the table. I hope that helps. Uh, what do you think of using hyperbaric chamber? Um, so I do think hyperbaric is going to be something that um, should help with that type of injury. So you're increasing the, the plasma oxygen. So I do think it might kind of benefit that area of penumbra. I think the centralized area, you're still gonna be left with dead tissue, but yeah, you might shrink down the penumbra to almost nothing with hyperbaric. So if you have it available, I'm, I would be willing to bet that's certainly an option. 
Um, a lot of the times it's a matter of whether or not you feel that they are safe to go into the hyperbaric chamber. So if they're flailing around or they're having seizures, I, I don't think um, most folks that use hyperbarics are gonna be super happy to put them in there unless you have ways to date them. So I, I think it's gonna be dog dependent on which ones you wanna put in, but I do think that would be beneficial. Could you repeat the treatment for seizures you mentioned? So um, I guess my trying to think of what I talked about in terms of seizures. So um, I'm assuming you mean probably in terms of, you know, Barbitol so, and Keppra. So I mean, seizures is definitely a whole nother talk. So I mean, my first line of treatment is generally Levetiracetam or Levetiracetam and Keppra. Um, those those three are synonymous. It's like Advil versus ibuprofen. Um, so it's the least sedating. It doesn't affect the liver. It doesn't affect the kidney. So for an older dog that might have underlying metabolic problems, it's by far my favorite thing to use, um, at least to start with. I mean, some dogs it's not enough. So, but you should know that fairly quickly after you start treatment with it. So um, generally, I load dogs on 60 milligrams, 60 milligrams per kilogram with Keppra. Um, so if that doesn't work, um, phenobarbital is, is where I go next. And the reason I mentioned that is because it does reduce cerebral metabolic demand. So it's kind of cerebral protective in areas of injury. So even head trauma, like it would be a good one to reach for. Um, so I like to give eight milligrams per kilogram as one injection. I mean, that's just what I was taught. So my young dogs, the loading dose is 16.16 milligrams per kilogram, and uh, the volume di distribution for phenobarbital is 0 0.8, so 16 divided by 0 0.8 gives you a, a drug level of 20. Um, so that's really kind of the target level in the blood. So, I mean, you can technically push that level up if you wanted to, but to me, the body's never seen phenobarbital, so 20 is probably at least a decent starting point. So that's why I reach for that number. So um, for an older dog, 20 will knock them unconscious more than likely. So that's why I would dose reduce a little bit and why I said I would use eight milligrams per kilogram. Some people were trained to give the eight milligrams as two different injections. So you get four milligrams per kilogram and two injections four hours apart. And I don't think there's a right or wrong um, to that. It's just my personal preference that I like to give the injection and know what I get out of it as opposed to waiting, you know, six hours to see what the two different injections do. So that's just my, my personal preference. If you are doing PT rehab for strokes patients, is laser therapy in the affected area contraindicated with vascular compromise risk of bleeding? Um, that is a great question and I don't have the answer for that. Um, my knowledge of laser is teeny tiny, so you definitely need to ask somebody smarter in lasers than I am. Dr. Levine chimes in again. Oh, steroids for cerebral edema. So, okay, Dr. Levine, you got me on that one. Um, so dogs, um, if you remember back to that big GRE void, so the hemorrhagic strokes, they do create vasogenic edema around the hemorrhagic infarct. So I will use short-term steroids around those dogs that Within a week, I have them off of it. So uh, for ischemic strokes, I would stay away. Um, what about patients already on steroids? Do you discontinue? Uh, so that is gonna also be patient dependent. The question is why are they on steroids? So if they have you know, meningitis and are on steroids because of that, then um, I would rather treat with blood thinners to try to reduce the risk of stroke as opposed to um, risk of the meningitis coming back. I mean, it's, it's gonna be which one's worse. So I think in the end, it's gonna have to be a patient dependent, but if they're on steroids for not an important reason, then I would absolutely get them off of steroids. So um, I am getting a text saying, um, it's time to wrap it up. So I'm gonna do two more questions and then um, we will, we will uh, wrap it up. If you have specific questions for me, please um, just reach out. I'm certainly happy to chat. Um, so uh, the next question on the list is, do you see problems with greyhounds related to the fibrinolytic disorders or is it more platelet-driven? Um, 
I don't really know why greyhounds are truly more represented with strokes. Um, I guess I always just assumed it was because their hematocrit's usually like 70% as a resting, so their blood's just a little thicker than most. Um, but I don't know if there's truly anything to decide, okay, is there something specifically related to what's happening in their blood that makes them more prone to stroke? So I don't know that answer. So, and then the next one, uh, this one's easy, is the webinar on YouTube. Um, Please, please ask uh, the folks down in Miami. I don't know where this goes afterwards. Um, so that, that I don't know. Um, with sus suspected old dog vestibular patients whose owners are unwilling, unable to do extensive diagnostics, would it be beneficial to start Plavix in case dealing with stroke? So dogs that, I mean, generally speaking, yeah, not everybody can do workup. So any patient that I have that I suspect a stroke, I give them two weeks to recover. If they recover and continue to recover, um, then I put them on Plavix, so I don't have any reason not to. Um, if they wax and wane over those two weeks, then I have to worry there's something else going on, uh, so I don't start Plavix. Um, so any dog that starts to get better and then gets worse, it's not a stroke, there's something else, in which case that's where I'd probably reach for, for prednisone. So if you have an acute neurologic disorder where you're like, hey, I think this is a going to be a stroke, really the best thing you can do is just supportive care, give them time, they will declare what they're going to, sorry, what they're going to do. So if they're getting better, then that would put the, the, the eggs in the stroke basket. If they aren't getting better, then there's probably something else. And that's where that's, I reach for prednisone. If I have questions that they're not getting better and stroke gets lower on the list, then that's where I start reaching for steroids to say, okay, let's treat for inflammation and see how much of that's contributing. If they start getting better after that, then that's narrowing down your differential at least a little bit. So I am going to uh, step out at this point. I have a Doberman I need to go address that's in the MRI. Um, so if you guys have questions for me, please don't hesitate to call. Um, I saw Dr. Levine chime in at least a few times. If, if you're over on the west coast of Florida, um, he's up in Sarasota. So I'm sure he'd be happy to chat at any point as well. So I hope you guys have a great afternoon. And if you need anything, just let us know. Thank you, Carol. Bye-bye.